what a privilege to be able to bring our speakers together for a panel discussion. You've heard from all of them as they presented earlier. And now I'm joined here by Dr. Abdul Ghani Mohammed, joining us from Australia. Dr. Shan Lee, who is joining us from Malaysia. Sir Arjun Putri Edaka, who is joining from Singapore. And Mr. Ofer bar who is joining us from Israel. So this is a truly international panel. Wonderful. All right, so uh, let's start the ball rolling. And uh, I have actually have a question on what you gentlemen think would be the definition of an intelligent drone. You know, people could define intelligent differently. So are they autonomous? Are they visual? So we'd like to hear what each of our panelists think. What are the three distinct features of an intelligent drone? Let me start with uh, Dr. Abdul Ghani. Oh, thank you. Um, I guess um, maybe it'll be a good point for me to share screen just to um, show some of the framework um, that we published that defines what we think, uh, I guess, is the is the definition of an intelligent drone. Hopefully you can see my screen now. Is that viewable? Yes, you can see Okay. So this is a bit of a complex diagram, but uh, I'll try to break it down. So. I guess what you can see here is um, what I presented in my presentation in terms of the sense, plan, and act cycle within a control system. So you can see here that this sort of, um, if you just look at the actuation part, and if you imagine that there's a pilot controlling that, then that would be the sort of lowest level of, of, of autonomy. I'll actually, I'll just uh, scroll to the, to the right there, if I can just zoom out. Um, so you can see the lowest level of autonomy. Um, being remotely piloted, obviously, or no autonomy at all. And then as you start considering, for example, a system that senses and plans and then leads to the actuation. And that increases once again uh, to an intelligent aircraft system, which includes those three components, inference, reasoning, and unsupervised learning. Um, but then the level of, uh, I guess, autonomy uh, increases uh, or intelligence increases if you start considering um, a swarm of aircraft sort of passing on that level of inference, reasoning, and, and uh, learning uh, to the rest of the swarm and sort of doing cooperative sensing, cooperative planning, and cooperative navigation. So that's, that's, uh, that's, that would be my, uh, my uh, thoughts, I guess. Thank you so much. How about uh, Dr. Shan? Uh, can we hear from you, your thoughts on this? Hello. I think Dr. Abdul Ghani has put it very well. I also think that to be able to be categorized as an intelligent drone, the first, uh, the first, um, the first requirement, the prerequisite, will be to navigate itself without any human input. So um, we will we will be giving the drone some high level inputs, like for example, do this task. But how would you want it to do it? That's up for the drone to decide how to navigate itself from point A to point B, where there will be obstacles in the middle and there will be weather changes and many other factors that will, that will stop the drone from doing its, its work. And if the drone is able to navigate itself from point A to point B by gathering data beforehand or at the same time doing the feedback, I would say that's an intelligent drone. Cool. And Arjun, what do you think? Yeah, uh, I think I second what uh, Dr. Rapsul Ghani and Dr. Lee had mentioned just now. Uh, so just to add on to it, uh, just to summarize uh, what I feel about uh, what are the three main parts. First one is uh, perceiving the environment. Uh, so an intelligent drone should be able to perceive its environment uh, much better than a standard drone, let's say. So it should be able to identify its environments, its parameters all around it. And second one is going to be the analytics that it can perform. So it's not only the data that it collects, uh, because everything happens in a real time basis. So the system should be able to analyze the data and generate results or outputs, uh, you know, on the flow, on the fly. And thirdly, I feel that the most important element for, uh, you know, a system to be intelligent is in terms of safety, because safety has always been one of the concerns, you know, when we talk about drones. So if, if, if the artificial intelligence system or any other sensor based systems, which can ensure high level of safety, uh, you know, for the system, I believe that 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 defines an intelligent drone. 
Thanks. And Ophir, what do you think are the three distinct features of an intelligent? Yeah, I think I think a lot of the a lot of my colleagues here have, have outlined all excellent points. The maybe the only one I would add, uh, because most of the rest is already said, is the full autonomous cycle of a system. So what we I mean being an applied, if I'm taking less the scientific approach, but more kind of the applied technology aspect of drones and the use cases they manage, the ability to work day in and out, day in, day out, you know, without any assistance or supervision uh, is what for us kind of defines true intelligence and, you know, the and independence uh, in a way. So getting from point A to point B uh, is, is, obviously a, is obviously a must, but it's also returning to whatever point you need to get making sure you have enough juice or, or battery for the next mission and, and then maintaining those ongoing ongoing you know day in day out basically without humans needing to intervene unless they need to uh, make specific decisions we do not want them to make right right so now we've established how we define an intelligent drone now now let's look at how you think man and machine can work together and how can the different workflows accommodate this collaboration? You know, we have an interesting mix of industries and segments where our panelists focus in. And so now questions, experts, how can humans leverage the technologies you've been talking about into their process workflow? Um, maybe I start like with Ofer this time. Ah, sure, thanks. So I think we really started uh, uh, in robotics with that actually challenge because what we've been seeing in those uh, smart building or building environments is uh, that humans are not really happy with the way things are going. So instead of humans focusing on what humans do best, which is decision making uh, based on, on quality data, we've seen humans spend too much time in basic, dull, dirty, dangerous data collection tasks. Uh, obviously, humans can do that uh, because, you know, uh, we are, but we're not very good at it. We make mistakes. Uh, you know, we, uh, we are prone to, uh, to error. We make assumptions on the data. We don't really objectively collect data, right? We always kind of uh, collect data from a certain position. And I think this is where we thought drones or autonomous drones could really help humans because the drones will do, I would say, the most, uh, you know, uh, uh, the most enhanced and, and quality data collection side. Uh, they could take some decisions themselves if they were allowed to, but then they really leave the decision making or the important decision making to the humans that kind of overseeing these solutions. And this is really where we see the sweet spots of, of drones and, and humans interacting in the building space. Hmm. Okay, Arjun, what are your thoughts? Oh, yeah, so this is a very interesting question. Uh, so let me uh, speak for the warehousing industry and warehousing segment. And I believe that, uh, you know, humans uh, and these machines uh, need to interact very closely with each other. And first of all, what we do as a process is to understand what are the existing process flows uh, that customers do uh, use inside their warehouse. So let's say if it is a stock taking process, there are particular steps that, uh, you know, most of the processes are done in a way. Uh, so we understand that and we see which are the areas where uh, people are having trouble with. So let's say if it's a human human based stock counting first is it's it's a very tedious process and you have to climb up heights in terms of doing the scanning. It causes uh, safety hazard and safety risk as well. So safety is at stake here. And at the same time, accuracy of the inventory is also at risk because usually it is said that uh, from a warehousing perspective, uh, if someone goes and uh, does a stock taking, uh, he can be productive only for like 47 pallets per hour. So that is the rate at which humans could do, uh, be it the case with you know any kind of humans. Uh, and at the same time, when you deploy a fully automated system, it can do 1,200 pallet locations per hour. So you can see it is almost like 25 times in terms of the productivity and the efficiency it can bring into the entire process. So these are certain areas where uh, you know it needs to be digitalized and so that you know people can look and do other productive uh, ways of uh, working. And especially in the warehousing industry segment, it is not attracting too much of talent because these are all mundane tasks which people are not interested in doing. So there is another angle to it as well. So if if all these mundane tasks can be done in a safe way using the drone system, then you know they could focus on other productive uh, ways of working uh, where you know human brain is much better than an automated system. So this is how I I, I feel uh, you know we need to look at the process and how it needs to interact with each other. 
All right, let's hear from Dr. Shan. Well, how, how, how is it like in Malaysia? Yeah, the way that intelligent drones work, right? So we have been working, I'll, I'll list out some of the examples of work that we've done. Right now, we're, we're trying to solve the, one of the biggest challenge that we're trying to solve is the vehicle routing problem. So we're, we're quite involved with the drone delivery process so we know that it's a it's a huge optimization problem that people tend to miscalculate and then we will make um, redundant trips around and then if we were to employ drones to run run around and i mean to fly around the map we would like to to, to do it in the most in, in the shortest path possible so one of the tricky things that we're trying to solve is the vehicle routing problem and whether the drones they have enough battery or not it is it is another crucial part of the equation that we need to take into account how heavy we are transporting and then how much battery we are we we, we have in, in how much battery we have in the battery capacity those things they do matter actually in, in when we are trying to solve this kind of problems in in the large scale so think of this as a if, if it's only one drone it's still okay but if you have what, like a hundred agents running around and then you have different altitudes to play with because in Malaysia we are allowed to fly from we are allowed to fly from 80 meters to 120 meters we have 40 meters to play with so this becomes a very complex problem and AI one I mean uh, reinforced learning will be able to help us out when we try to tackle these kind of problems so the optimization is uh, the, the optimization of these kind of problems can be solved more quickly if we were to introduce some some kind of machine learning preferably re reinforcement learning in this kind of problems and for um, agriculture wise it's not too much of a there's not too much need of intelligent drones to to be honest we just need to deploy them and then just have them running uh, flying around collecting data and then the intelligence will come afterwards at the post processing so that's my take all right dr abdul ghani how, how do you think can man and machine work together um, yeah, I think there's a lot of opportunities uh, for um, sort of human machine um, interaction and um, sort of supporting um, each other. And there is, I guess, from from what I've seen in terms of industry's requirements and some of the applications that we worked on, um, it's it's quite a increasing sort of a, a growing area, especially to try and make the systems intuitive for operators uh, without the need to try and you know, delve into the into the details, or um, um, and and it's easy to adapt the technology. We've seen that with, for example, um, examples of you know working with first responders, fire brigades, uh, trying to, um, in a sense, co-support uh, human human elements. There are applications you would want to replace the human element entirely um, if if there is a risky sort of. Um, uh, operation or there's risk to the human but there are situations where you want them to actually support the human elements um, uh, whether it's being you know firefighters entering a building and you want to have the the drones go in there and sort of uh, scope out the situation which is very relevant to some of the the things that um, uh, Arjun and Ofer mentioned um, uh, otherwise you know there's other applications like for example uh, you know inspection um, of um, whether it's being uh, infrastructure uh, in turn, you know, I've seen inspection of aircraft at airports, uh, airport hangars using drones, uh, which would save a lot of time and effort uh, with respect to having people go on top of the, the, the structure of the vehicle itself. Uh, so I, I think I think it, there is definitely um, lots of opportunities there. I've even seen uh, companies that approached us from a research perspective as a research institute to try and see whether uh, we can sort of uh, prototype and co-develop um, vehicles that would do very unique applications like for example testing um, um, the hooks that uh, for example window cleaners would hook onto on skyscrapers to clean um, you know the windows on the side to because they need to do that as part of the certification for example so there's all sorts of unique applications and and um, air, airborne drones or, or flying robots can certainly help um, in that aspect all right, so now uh, let's talk about regulations. And this is very important. How can airspace regulators make the collaborations that you just mentioned happen? Now, what do they need to look into? 
So let's start with Arjun. Um, yeah. So okay. yes, there yeah. you go. Now we can hear you. Yeah. Uh, yeah, thank, thanks for the question. Uh, I believe regulations are very important and uh, specifically in terms of deciding in which direction a particular industry could go. Uh, so let's say if, if, there are, if the regulations are too stringent, then it becomes, you know, the, the industry might not be able to proceed further. Uh, so regulations are very crucial uh, in terms of, uh, you know, even for outdoor applications or for indoor applications as well. So what I feel is that uh, there is no unified standard as of now available. Uh, so each country has their own set of rules uh, based on their economic conditions and different aspects of things. They generate their own set of rules. And it is very different from the other regions as well. Uh, so I, I believe that you know once uh, this is the initial gestation period. And after that, uh, once all the data is collected, I believe uh, there could be a unified data or unified set of regulations that most of the industries could follow. Then it would be much of standardization and you know we could take these solutions to different regions and in different uh, areas as well and since being in singapore i could say that you know singapore is one of the uh, uh, one of the places where the rules are very strict and and i've seen this entire process move from you know uh, from the early stages uh, till as of now uh, and it has been very meticulously uh, planned and carefully uh, thought of as well uh, so initially when it was started uh, you know the cas collected collect quite a lot of uh, data from each of the vendors uh, understood what are the pain points what needs to be sorted out and they introduce different set of rules in different phases uh, so you know even if you look at 2021 there were few rules that happened in february a few changes that happened in may 2021 as well uh, specifically talking about the warehousing uh, segment previously for indoor applications there were no restrictions uh, in terms of using a system because it's a closed environment it's it's considered as a private property you do it you do it uh, for outdoor there were quite a lot of restrictions now what i see is that uh, some of the restrictions are coming into the indoor space as well which i believe is quite good uh, because ultimately it is the aviation and the public safety and also if it is an indoor environment it's the safety of the people that are working in. if safe so i see that it's mostly related to safety that is happening where you know we need to give a, a, a risk assessment uh, for the particular area in terms of an activity permit so there are a few rules and regulations that are there uh, you know, uh, which previously was there for outdoors. Now we have we are seeing it for indoors. But I think these are all for good. But if if there can be a unified uh, set of rules, that would be perfect. All right, Doctor Abdul Ghani, are you seeing the same thing? Do you think indoor drones uh, may need less regulation compared to outdoor? Is it more difficult to put regulations for urban drones? Uh, it certainly is, and it's uh, it's a it's a big challenge. It's a big security challenge as well, uh, and we are seeing. Uh, let's say, an abuse of um, this technology uh, in various sectors. Um, so so uh, it, it's quite challenging. And one of the hard things for regulators is you, you can put all the rules you want. Policing them is a whole different story. Uh, and there are um, some discussions around how can you actually enforce those regulations. Uh, and that in itself is quite quite a challenge. But there's... there's um, several let's say bodies within um let's say the, the australian government and within also industry uh, that are trying to tackle that and look at that um we've all seen what happened in um in, in the uk a few years back when uh, the airport was uh, was sort of attacked by some of those drones so it's very hard from that perspective so i think that the regulations need to balance the security but also the flexibility to make sure that you're empowering you know uh, businesses with this new technology um certainly outdoor um sort of environments is is very challenging compared to indoors and i think there should be a um a difference in regulations in australia currently anything that's indoor uh, uh doesn't uh apply uh, it doesn't have the the same restrictions as, as outdoors so um, maybe australia is also one of the a more relaxed uh, has one of the more relaxed regulations uh around the world and um and that had uh, definitely its uh, its pros and and you know our regulation body is really heavily relying on you know common sense of people um but you're always going to have people who really test the system um and that can be uh, quite a challenge right that's another panel discussion for us to work on but dr shan are there any specific challenges in regulating drones used in agriculture? Well, to be honest, <laughs> it's very difficult to enforce, especially when you're in the rural areas. 
people are using drones and they will be using drones to, to cultivate their land. And even though there are restrictions and regulations in Malaysia specific to agricultural drones, it is very difficult to enforce like what Dr. Abu Ghani had said. Well, the, the industrial applications, for example, for those who fly, that the drones that fly um, longer distances beyond visual line of sight, those will be, those will be more, uh, I think the, the priority should be on the beyond visual line of sight drones where you cover long distances and, and the regulators are, are starting to notice about that and then we are seeing more and more that they are structuring up and then writing more regulation in terms of how to how to maintain communications for 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 example for the long distance drones as for the agriculture ones even though there are some rules but people really do not follow and it is very hard to enforce we we will be looking for a a a a, a method or some way to help to regulate this industry all right so Ophir, uh, what are some of the regulations which must be considered to ensure the success of intelligent drones so to be honest i think i think in, the, in regards to outdoor uh my colleagues have i think answered that uh, very well indoor one of the reasons we operate indoors and in many cases people ask us can you operate also outdoors and we say Absolutely no, uh, not because uh, you know the technology. Because simply we want to avoid regulation. And one of the nice things about indoor that currently there is no uh, regulation that we are uh, uh, familiar with, at least in the markets that we operate for indoors. What customers are more concerned about indoors is less the regulation and more the safety, because you're operating in a very uh, and I think Arjun alluded to that in, in a prior comment. You're more you're working in a very close, confined, packed spaces. The space changes all the time. You know, it's enough that someone moves the box or leaves the, for us in many cases, you know, the cleaning person leaves the cleaning cart. It's just on our route, you know, uh, in the middle of the night or maintenance people leave a ladder that we need to bypass. And, you know, drones carrying lithium ion batteries, you know, are, are uh, potentially uh, could also, you know, be prone to, to fire or, or to explode. So really it's more the safety aspects that customers are, are really looking at, less the uh, less kind of, you know, government regulatory bodies that are currently looking into this space. I assume that the more we see people actually adopting these solutions, some of these maybe safety concerns will convert into regulatory, you know, actions uh, by regulators as, as, uh, as, you know, customers will want to get some more, I would say, a comfort uh, that you're meeting certain specifications and certain regulations before they implement your solution, you know, indoors. But currently, we're happy to kind of navigate in this uncharted territory, at least regulatory-wise. All right. Thank you so much for all your insights. I'd like to check the chat and see if anyone from the audience would like to pose a question to our panelists. We may have time to answer one or two. So, um, so if you have a burning question, feel free to type it on the chat box it's there on your right side and uh maybe we can take it with our panelists and uh i see none i think we have a very quiet audience but i'm sure they they all learned a lot from all, all our speakers um so i actually now would like to ask a final question or a visioning question to our panelists so gentlemen if you can define or envision future drones, what would they be like? Are they bigger, smaller? How would have we solved the battery issues? Can you, you know, can you describe what they can do? So um, let's start with, who do I start with? Okay, let's start with Ophir. I see you first on my screen. So yeah, uh, <laughs> what is your vision? <laughs> what's your vision of a future drone? So for us, it's a good question because we talk a lot. We talk about it a lot. So you know, obviously, we're very consumed with the with the next 12, 24 months. But we always talk about so what's next once once we solve that. So for us, really, the vision is is for drones, especially in indoors, uh, to be part of a bigger robotics ecosystem that would operate indoors. And and we really believe that this ecosystem could be 
the consciousness of what we call kind of the building as a living organism, uh, meaning uh, that it will be aware uh, of anything that is going on in the building and be able to make life for the occupants of that building, whether this is a commercial space or, uh, you know, a residential space, uh, much a better, easier, better quality. So it will know, for take the most, you know, simple example. You walk out of the meeting room, right? Uh, you have chairs all over the place. Maybe some people left glasses, you know, and maybe someone actually bumped the chair into the wall and you have those dark lines, you know, on the side. Uh, so once you walk out, you know, robots, you know, come in, they will put the chairs in the place. They will clean the table. A robot may even come and paint, you know, the wall. I'm exaggerating a bit, but uh, but really this is kind of the vision of the robotics, you know, and drones will play a very big part in this because they are the most mobile and the, you know, agile, you know, device of all in terms of the ability to operate in different spaces. Uh, they would really provide this consciousness uh, and seamlessly will enable, you know, the building occupants to kind of enjoy a better experience. Yeah, isn't it exciting to <laughs> to be able to see that? Now, yeah, okay. we, we think so. Some people yeah. think it's frightening, but we we see it as exciting. <laughs> and and what's what's exciting is on this panel are the people who are actually making that happen. So see, this this is that's that's the power of this discussion. Um, so, Dr. Shan, um, how do you envision the future drones? All right, imagine this. Picture this. One week, seven days. You just you 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 can choose to work one day or you can just choose to not work at all. Everything is done by the robots. Agriculture sector, right? 5 a.m. tractors start to roll themselves out automatically to cultivate the farmlands. Drones will start to spray the pesticides and then you know the plants will start to grow. Another robot drone will start to take care of the farm animals. And then when the plants grow and then it's time to harvest, the robots will go and harvest. They are already tomato pickers, grape pickers, you know, things like that. They will pick up all the food and then ship it with self-driving trucks, ship it all the way to the market. The market will sort them up like Amazon, autonomous to the shelf. We, the people, will go to the, to the the grocery store, pick up that food, go home. Amazon has done that. Um, no checkout grocery stores, right? Take whatever you want, leave, and then it will just bill to you. And then because all these things are, are, are done by the robots, food will cost very little. So we can afford to work maybe one day or two days a week. The rest of the time, people will be able to enjoy and then to do something more creative to improve the efficiency of the robots to make things even cheaper. So that's what I envision. And if you buy something online, you should be able to get it within one hour because you should have drones that is, you know, drones that are able to get things from the warehouse automated, like Mr. Arjun's system, right? You have something that automates your warehouse sort everything out, get that stuff, drones will pick it up, go straight to your apartment, drop it off, less than one hour. So that will be life. Wonderful. That's another amazing depiction of, of uh, what you envision with drones and robots. Uh, it's got, yeah, it's got me starting to think about having that farm. You, we should talk after this. So, <laughs> yeah. An apple will cost maybe just 10 cents, something like that. Isn't that amazing? All right. And and working once a week, if you yeah. choose to, right? If you choose to. All right. So Arjun, what is your vision on how intelligent today's drones will evolve into? Yeah. I mean, if you look at a five-year or a 10-year period, uh, so let me just split into two parts, right? So one, you have the hardware and then you have the software. So the trend that I'm currently seeing, and which is something which I feel is going to continue for some more years, and maybe until 2030, is that... Uh, the hardwares are going to get commoditized, meaning to say that, you know, hardware will reach a certain level of saturation. Uh, I'm not talking about the battery. Yes, battery, definitely there is a big deficit in terms of technology that needs to be done. But all other aspects of a drone would become a commodity. Uh, it's just, you know, just plain hardware. Now it becomes the software or the technology stack that makes the sense. 
and and that is going to build revenue for companies and then you know help companies to grow as well because they can increase and develop their technology stack as well so this is something which i foresee so it is in the software portion that you know quite a lot of stuff can be done a lot of interesting uh, researches are happening on the ai portion uh, which can be uh, deployed so that truly in in a sense would take the drones to any kind of industry uh, in terms of the application as well so just to summarize like how i see it uh, inside a warehouse let's say or maybe in any other location is that uh, it's not a single drone it will be a swarm of drones which will be communicating with each other they are cloud connected they are uh, api enabled uh, they are ai enabled and they they are able to do their tasks so i think this is this is something that i envision uh, going forward and hopefully if the battery technology improves you know we don't need a tethered uh, system uh, to be used uh, but yeah yeah so that is that is definitely something which i'm looking forward to as well that's great thank you so much arjun and uh, so dr abdul ghani you'll be the last panelist to be sharing your thoughts and uh, which means this is actually the closing remarks of some sort. Um, how do you envision these drones will evolve into? I think, um, no, I, I agree with uh, a lot of the comments that were made. And um, what we've seen was there's there's been a lot of focus just from a, from, from the start of, of um, when drones and spe specifically airborne robotics um, uh, started, there was a lot of focus on the, on the vehicle itself and getting that sort of sorted and giving it enough um you know autonomy so that it undertakes you know specific um tasks and then we're seeing that as arjun mentioned there's a there's a significant peak at the moment to try and really you know let's let's not worry about the platform let's really focus on the ai the software let's give it the intelligence but i think what's going to happen after some time is it's going to asymptote and we're going to see um a focus back again on the vehicle to try and modify it to really enable then the software to do specific tasks, um, especially with the, um, I guess, the growing interest in very unique applications. You know, whether you need to stick a robotic arm on a drone, for example, how do you do that? You you know, you probably need to modify the, the, the vehicle itself, um, especially with also new uh, technologies and, and sensors being uh, added to the to the vehicles so that's that would be that would be my thoughts i think from from what i've seen and from the large number of weird and wacky uh, applications that uh, we've been approached as a university to try and do from you know lifting heavy cables 50 kilograms um you know flying to you know carry people or, or whatnot I, I think it's a it's a very um it's a difficult answer to, to to question to answer because it varies. It's um, it's such a large sort of you know thing, right? Like different sizes, personal transportation to very small drones that you can wear, for example. Um, so it's yeah. I, I think I think we're overall we're headed in the right direction. Uh, and uh, based on what uh, Dr. Sheehan said. I, I imagine probably in the future we'd want to invest in our own drones so that we can get some income from if they're going to do all the work. <laughs> maybe we uh, replace the, the stock market with the <laughs> drone market or something. So, but um, yeah, so thank you. Cool. See, uh, there are so many collaborations that I think will be uh, starting from here. In fact, Ophir, I think there's a message on the chat that you may want to take. Uh, and it, it depends whether you want the public to, to know about it or you want to discuss with him. Uh, someone's interested about the Tando drone. And yep, that's that's really wonderful. Thank you so much, gentlemen, for sharing your insights, exciting us even more on how the world of drones will look like. In